and welcome to the second module of the ICMAI Aguardis Multimedia Online Resources devoted to Yves Chevalard and the anthropological theory of the didactic. This module deals with the notion of didactic transposition. We will show you how it can be used as a tool for the didactic analysis. As explained in the introduction, the first four modules of the unit are related to a lecture given by Yves Chevalard in Osaka in 2016. The notion of didactic transposition is presented there in pages two to seven. Chevalard recalls that this notion is at the origin of the anthropological theory of the didactic, the ATD, and first appeared in the book La Transposition Didactique du Savoir Savant au Savoir Enseigné, published in 1985. We will see in this module what didactic transposition is and how it can be used as a methodological tool to analyze some aspects of the reality and aspects that are not often considered in educational research. It will help us question the world, formulate new questions, and point at phenomena that would otherwise remain transparent, invisible. What I'd like to show in this module is that didactic transposition is not only the description of a process, but a methodology of research. Let us start with a teaching problem. That is a problem that affects teacher practice that is part of the teacher's concerns. For instance, how to teach proportionality to seven graders. Let us focus on what is called proportionality. We assume this as a mathematical piece of knowledge that appears in the curriculum and then different possible expressions, just proportionality or ratios of proportions or proportional relationships, etc. This is what we call a piece of knowledge to be taught. For the moment, it's just a project, something to be done. When this piece of knowledge is actually taught, we will talk about taught knowledge. Knowledge to be taught and taught knowledge. Why using this distinction? Because there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between them. From the same curriculum proposal or description, the same knowledge to be taught, we can obtain different activities implemented in the classroom, different pieces of knowledge, of taught knowledge. And this difference is difficult to express if we use only the word knowledge, which is uncountable in English. It would be better to say different taught knowledges with an S, but the grammar doesn't let us do it. The teachers of the teaching problem consist in asking the way to pass from the knowledge to be taught to the taught knowledge. And then what is also important, to obtain good learned knowledge. A new entity does not coincide necessarily, as all teachers know, with the taught knowledge. The conversion or transformation of the knowledge to be taught into taught knowledge and then into learned knowledge is what is called the internal didactic transposition. It takes place mainly in the educational system, in the schools and in the classrooms, and in the group of students within the classroom. The knowledge to be taught, however, comes from a place surrounding the educational system, a kind of membrane, what we call the no-sphere, the sphere of those who think Knows means think in Greek about the educational system. When we consider a teaching problem, like how to teach proportionality, we assume that we know what proportionality is. We will just assume that even if there are many different ways to teach and learn proportionality, all of them deal with the same piece of knowledge. In, even if the methodology and the results might vary a lot. The piece of knowledge is here taken as a given. If you allow me to use a mathematical metaphor, we can say that proportionality is considered more like a parameter than an unknown. 
only teaching and learning are the unknowns to determine. When doing research in the anthropological theory of the didactic, we adopt a different perspective. We start by questioning the piece of knowledge that is involved in the teaching and learning process. If we start from the knowledge to be taught, we will ask, what is this thing you call proportionality? What is it made of? Where does it come from? What is it for? Why and how has it been selected to be part of the knowledge to be taught? In this way of questioning, we will consider a new entity, which does not usually appear in the formulation of the teaching problem. This new entity is the scholarly knowledge. This is the knowledge produced by scholars, those who know best about the knowledge to be taught, or are supposed to know best, are considered to know best. In the case of mathematics, Scholars can be, for instance, mathematicians, those who produce mathematical knowledge, but they can be also those who use mathematical knowledge. As you can read in the lecture's notes, scholars are those who provide the epistemological legitimacy, legitimacy sorry, of the knowledge that is taught at school. There is a strong assumption here. What is taught at school is something that generally comes from the outside, except in the case where the school and the scholarly institution are the same. That is when you learn from the scholars themselves. But in general, what, it, what is taught at school exists outside school. It is not an invention of school. There is another institution, the scholarly institution, that legitimates and guarantees the authenticity of the knowledge that is taught. The enlargement of the unit of analysis is clear. We have added the external didactic transposition process, which considers the relationships between the knowledge to be taught and the scholarly knowledge. If the internal didactic transposition is associated to the teaching problem, this external didactic transposition step can be related to the curriculum problem. What should be taught and how? Well, let us go back to proportionality. According to the didactic transposition theory, we are now asking questions about the nature, origin, selection, delimitation, role, etc., of this piece of knowledge. And to answer them, we have to consider all the institutions that takes place in the didactic transposition process, in the different steps of the didactic transposition process. In the case of proportionality, what are we looking at? So in the case of the scholarly knowledge, we will look at mathematicians, also other scientists, and we can look at different historical periods. In the case of the noosphere, we will look at the society, how is proportionality considered there? We will look at the school system, especially the school decision makers, teacher education also, because it also influences a lot what happens at, in the school system, and educational research in different historical periods too. You will find here some pieces of, of empirical information we have gathered, just to give you the flavor of the type of institution search, and especially the kind of empirical data that can be found. For instance, if we look at the scholarly institution today, we can conclude that proportionality has not an official status. A simple search in the Encyclopedia of Mathematics shows no entries for proportion or proportionality. We can only find arithmetic proportion, but nothing about geometric proportion. And in the entry about arithmetics, we find a kind of identification between the theory of proportions and the theory of fractions. If we go back to the 7th, 3rd century, always in the scholarly institution, the situation is rather different. This is just an example of Newton's work, and you will see that he used 
to use proportional or ratios and proportions as we use today the functional language. With the work of Euler, a theory of ratios and proportions was emerging. And we will find it reproduced in several versions during the next centuries. Here you have, for instance, a book of Hodgson from 1840 called Arithmetic and Algebra with a typical presentation of the elements of the theory of ratios and proportions, including a lot of techniques about how to calculate with proportions that we can find in many, many other books. I will now quickly present some more evidence of other institutions like the Nosfer, the Society, but I suggest you to keep in mind the following questions. About the scholarly institutions, how has the status of proportionality varied in scholarly knowledge from the 17th to the 21st century? What differences appear between mathematicians and other scientists today? In the Nosfer, what were the main elements of the theory of ratios and proportions? How did they appear in the arithmetic and algebra old textbooks? What was the role played by quantities in this ancient mathematical organization? How did the modern math reform modify this content? This is an essential point. What new links were introduced and what old connections were vanished? Then, what elements of the theory of writers and proportions have been reintroduced in the new curriculum and how? How do the old and new mathematical content coexist? What redundancies, incoherencies, disconnections, etc., might appear? What's the role played by quantities in current school mathematical organizations? So here you are, a piece of evidence from the scholarly knowledge of other scientists in the 20th century with the use of proportional relationships or in the 21st centuries, a little bit the same. Here you are, a piece of evidence of the new math reforms and the new status provided to proportionality, which is almost evanescent. Then today in the educational system where proportionality appears as a proportional reasoning and is considered one of the most fundamental topics in middle grade mathematics. But then in a book about teacher education, it does not appear as a central chapter a book called The Mathematics That Every Secondary School Mathematical Teacher Needs to Know. And finally, two episodes of proportionality in the society that I let you discover by yourselves. We will stop our exploration of empirical data here, but I do recommend you to make your own inquiry about proportionality or any other piece of knowledge to ask where does it appear? How is it made of? Where does it come from, etc. If you try to do the analysis of didactic transposition processes, you will certainly raise questions about the analytical tools that have been introduced till now. For instance, how is scholarly knowledge determined? Is it always close to university or to research? Can there be different scholarly institutions or knowledges? Can there be educational processes without any scholarly knowledge? What happens when the taught knowledge is perceived as too different from the scholarly knowledge? Or on the contrary, when it is perceived as too close? And finally, how much of the history of the discipline and the educational system needs to be studied in the analysis of didactic transposition processes? How much historian should a didactician be? What methodological issues might appear at this respect? You will find some pieces of answers in Yves Chevalier's lecture and also in the entry didactic transposition of the Encyclopedia of Mathematics Education and in the references that are presented there. Thank you very much for your attention and see you in the next module about proxiologies.